Hey, Fed Heads, welcome back to Sharing Our Pairings. We're going to be smoking the Atabe Lancero tonight. Put my hand behind that so you can get a good view on the on the screen there if you're watching. Uh, we're here with John Reiner and Barry Stein, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Sharing Our Pairings. I'm your host, Trip. We're broadcast live around the world on the Armed Forces. No, we're not. No, we're broadcast live around the world on Facebook and broadcast around the world after the fact on the Armed Forces Radio Network, uh, available as a podcast or on your favorite YouTube catcher. I switch those around. Man, Trip, you need some whiskey, I think. Wow. I do. I need some whiskey. I need a cigar. You uh, make a shout podcast out to... professional. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm, I'm ruining it here. Uh, but you think he didn't have 100 shows under his belt or something? Yeah, exactly. I've done this 100 times, easily. It, probably probably more than 100 now, since I do two shows a week, and I've been doing it for over a year. Um, but, you know, that's that's how my brain works. It, it's never quite right. But we're here. We're smoking the Atabe Lancero. Um, I'm very excited to get into this cigar. I've already We've already been smoking it for a little bit, but we're excited to tell you guys about it. Um, first, let's see how, our, how my guest hosts here are doing here. Uh, let's start with you, Barry. How you doing? Uh, cold and rainy New Hampshire. I tried to set up a pop-up tent outside. Started retaining water. It collapsed. I put my foot down. I told my wife, I'm smoking in the house and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> and uh, she'll tell you I was kicking and screaming on the floor like a little girl. But I won. Please, please, here I please. Am smoking. <laughs> I can't miss this podcast. <laughs> How about you? I, I said John Reiner at the beginning, but... I said it because that's what it says at the top of my screen on Skype. Um, it's actually John McTavish now. Uh, it is you official. Can explain that if you feel like, but you know. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> a lot of changes this year. Obviously, I'm uh, with Developing Palettes now, um, and I did a name change because uh, I've got a wedding coming up, and it's much easier for me to do a name change uh, before the Way wedding, easier. and then she can change to my name. Uh, because I'll tell you, up in Canada, a name change is a very, very painful process. It took me. Uh, I think it was like close to 90 days to execute. And then afterwards, I still have probably another 90 days of paperwork to go through. So it's 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 a bit of a work. But on the positive end of the spectrum, it was supposed to be rainy and cold. Like, like uh, I think it was like 40, 44, 45 freedom degrees. And I was like, ah, it's a little chilly, but at least it's above zero. And of course, because uh, we've decided to skip right over spring, uh, there's not a cloud in the sky. Uh, when I came out here, I had my jacket on and Barry's like, what's the matter with you? <laughs> well, I, you know, how cold is it up there? And I realized it's not cold at all. Cause it's like 66 freedom, which I should actually be out here in a t-shirt if I was a real man. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I know that it's going to drop to about 50 and, you know, I feel like I'm already acclimating to the warm weather. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep the hoodie just in case, just in case. And, uh, about the name change it's, so I almost changed my name. Cause as, as I've talked about before, and actually, as I talked about with John privately just a couple of days ago, uh, my real name isn't Trip, but I thought about adding it to the beginning because it's always been a thing where like some things say Trip and some things say my real first name, and it's annoying. Um, and I I, re I didn't end up doing it, but it's way easier right before, or right after you get married. Yeah, like the law is just like, all right, yeah, I mean that makes sense. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. When other times they like grill you hardcore about it, and Jose. Hernandez has a question. Why are you with developing palettes now? That's a good question. I don't, I don't know if I really... a little bit on the show before. Yeah, we talked about it on the show, and I know like um, we're still getting messages actually saying, like, what? You're with developing palettes? I thought you were Cigar Federation. Um, I don't know. I think um, with the ownership change, uh, I've been considering changing for a while, so it wasn't a, a matter of the ownership change because I love Chris and Kyle. Super good dudes. I love Trippy. Yeah. I love Dennis. I love the whole Cigar Federation crew, but... Um, I'd been looking to make a change for a while, um, partly because uh, I needed to change my workload. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's really, there's nothing nefarious about it. I mean, I could say I hate Logan, and uh, he's 100% of the reason why I just, I couldn't wait to get out. But uh, that'd be that'd be a lie. As much yeah, as exactly. Sure. Um, for, for anybody reading too much into it, it's totally amicable. Uh, we still talk to John every single day, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And, you know... Uh, there's no hard feelings. And we also talk to the, the guys from developing pallets a lot. We're just, yeah, I mean, we're going to, we're going to have a media house in Vegas. So, uh, 
there's going to be a lot of whiskey and a lot of beer being drank. So mm -hmm. certainly uh, everybody gets along well enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. a whole community. Like we all interbreed. I mean, here I am from another <laughs> podcast. I'm yeah, exactly. Podcast. John's going to be on my podcast. So we all, you know, we're inbred. Yeah. It's like keep, yeah. keep it, you lose a job keep it in the family. Company, you're going to show up with another company. That's right. It's the way it is. I mean, isn't the entire cigar industry incestuous? Like nobody, you know, you always like, in fact, I think there was an announcement just, uh, what a day ago or two days ago where, uh, Zev landed with, um, Altadis. Was it no, Altadis? Not Altadis? He wound up with, uh, Balmoral. Oh, there uh, we the go. The company Balmoral. behind Balmoral. Oh right. yeah. Uh, Royal Agio. Royal Agio. Agio. Yeah. Yeah. Which so, was distributed by Jewish state who we work for that right. let him go. And here he is now with Royal Agio. <laughs> It's like it's like the triple threat of of uh, incestuous right there, but we're we're not here to talk about that. No, no. Um, and I just want to say a note about we're not here to talk about that. That's my favorite way to start a show. We get completely off topic, and then we have to wrangle it in. Um, so let's talk about the cigar. So, uh, if, so if people haven't heard of Atabe, I Barry's the the cigar authority when it comes to Atabe's around here. Literally, the cigar authority. <laughs> So uh, we spoke in the Atabe Spiritus. Um, if you listen to my show and you listen to Dr. Goodhead, he calls it the Spiritus. Um, but it measures seven and a half by 40. It's a $30 cigar. A box ranges for set of range, uh, $749. And the uh, tobacco's from Parts Unknown. So it's made by Nelson Alfonso, who does all the artwork for Habanos SA. And the name Atabe brings the whole uh taino indian heritage to full circle because cohiba is the circle that the uh, tribe sits around to pray they give their prayers to the leader of the tribe the behike and the behike relays those prayers to the goddess atabe so it's the full circle of the taino indian i didn't know that i didn't know that either that's really interesting barry with a little knowledge drop there a little knowledge bomb um and so Thirty dollars is a lot of money for a cigar. We can all admit that. It is. Um, it's a nut. <clears throat> and personally, the first time that I saw the brand, I was like, I can't believe they're charging that much. It's because of those cool tubos. Then yep. they lost the tubos for a lot of the or a lot of the lines. Like back then, I think they really only had the tubos. Because because um, can we just say that they? I mean, you know, there's uh, it's a common phrase to say they're one of. I feel comfortable saying they have the best packaging in the absolutely. cigar industry. Period. Not one of the best packaging, the best packaging in the cigar industry. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's gorgeous packaging. Um, and I thought it was all about the packaging. Then when I smoked an Atabe, it was like, wow, this is this is spectacular. Uh, and then when I talked to uh, young Nelson, I don't think he's Nelson Jr., but he's the younger Nelson Alfonso. Um, Nelson Alfonso, the creator of the cigars, it's his son. And he explained the process that goes into these cigars, which is... Um, I'm trying to remember it off the top of my head. I should have watched well, my interview. Five different kinds of cedar, I think. So I know because yeah, I just finished Cuban, doing Cuban cedar. Yeah. So I just finished doing the uh, the B roll, and there's a hilarious moment where Trippy's smoking. Um, oh. He's smoking an Atabe, and they're having a conversation, and they turn to 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 Trippy, and Trippy's so entranced by the Atabe, <laughs> he kind of looks around, confused, like a hot woman just walked by, and he's like, "What's what's going on?" had no idea yep. what was going on because he was so taken aback by the cigar. Yeah, one of the cedars that is used to age this, and I want to say it's Lebanese cedar, but don't hold me to that. Can't be yeah, there's one really exotic country. one. So what they do is they shave down old furniture made of cedar to create this the, the wood chips because oh, you wow. can't wow. harvest trees or anything anymore. So they have to take pre-existing stuff built with that cedar. And they shave it down, and they use that as one of the cedars to age the cigar. And he, part of the reason, also, the, part yeah, of the, reason the price on the Cigar Authority this past week, we just did this thing about wages in cigar making countries. Yeah, uh, Honduras has the lowest wage uh, wage outside of Cuba, uh, but Costa Rica, where this cigar is made, has the highest monthly wage. So. The price oh. isn't because of the packaging. It's because of how much people make in Costa Rica. And, and I mean, I'll talk about the the uh, construction in a minute. But one of the things that I specifically remember is with the cedar, they aged them, I think, for six months or, or a year on the cedar. 
and every couple of years they actually sand the cedar down, so it's always fresh cedar. Correct. Um, Correct. And the construction on these cigars is nothing short of perfect. I mean, that kind of goes without saying when you're paying $30. If you pay $30 and you get a cigar that doesn't draw good or isn't constructed well, um, you should talk to the manufacturer because that's not – they don't they don't have any room for that in their, in their QA. Don Bleeker has a question. He keeps hearing rumors that there's Cuban tobacco in the brand. Any truth to that? All I know is that they won't tell us anything. Yeah, and if there was Cuban it. tobacco in it, it wouldn't be able to be imported into the U.S. That that is true. Yeah, and my uh, my palate my palate doesn't my palate is saying that there isn't Cuban tobacco. I think uh, Cuban tobacco. I mean, if you if you tasted enough tobacco, and Barry can certainly attest to this, you can tell like if you smoke uh, like Dominican Pelo Oro or or any mm-hmm. you know standout Dominican tobacco, like you immediately know what that tastes like. Same thing with like. Um, Jalapa tobacco really stands out for me in Nicaragua. Um, Cuban tobacco just has this particular flavor, and if it's in a cigar, you know. And if it's not, in, I yeah. mean, you can tell aromas and tastes and everything. And a lot of time, there's that floral component that's synonymous for Cuban cigars, at least for me anyway. Yeah, yeah. And it's non-existent in this cigar. Yeah. It's just an exquisitely blended cigar. Mm. Yeah, and speaking of that, let's talk about the flavors that we're getting before we get into our drinks here. And as we've said, this is going to be a long episode, so if you're watching, <laughs> strap in, uh, because we haven't even gotten to our first drink, and uh, we're up well, against the first break here. <laughs> I'm on my third. Speak for yourself. <laughs> well, no, I've, I've been drinking, but we haven't talked about our drinks yet. Okay. That's what I mean. Hashtag not an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hashtag don't try this at home. <laughs> so uh, how would you guys explain the profile to people? Let's, let's do John first. So, I mean, having having had the Mysticos, uh, which is unfortunately a very high benchmark to compare to, um, the initial the initial few puffs and still, it's all I could describe it as is a s'more. So you've got like a toasted marshmallow, like that creamy toasted marshmallow sweetness, not like a cloying sweetness, but that sort of soft, elegant mushroom or uh, mushroom. Uh, <laughs> it's not mushrooms, marshmallow. Uh, marshmallow. Uh, boy, I need another drink. Uh, and then underneath that, it's got like a like a really like a lightly toasted graham cracker. And then there's this elegant chocolate underneath all of that. And I'm and I'm still working my th- my way through it. It's really to me like a like a high end scotch. Like you taste it, and then you have to kind of sit down and go, well, what did I just taste? And go back and go back and go yeah, back because it's absolutely it's very elegant. It's incredibly elegant. Bo says Mysticos is his favorite out of a just unbelievable. I mean, we were John and I were blown away by that cigar. Mm-hmm. The uh, Mysticos kind of has a a uh, a pronounced black cherry or cherry sweetness. Yeah, yeah. That you can pick up right on the cold draw. You can pick it up on the first third. The Lancero has a different type of sweetness, but yeah. there's still this huge complexity to it that I've never experienced in a Lancero before. That's, I think that's a good point, Barry, because, you know, it, it, uh, first it of all, it's a true Lancero. Um, so you've got a limited amount of, of tobacco that you can work with. And it is, it is, I mean, a lot of people take Lanceros for granted, like Lancero freaks take Lanceros for granted, but they're a massive pain. And the, the manufacturers will be the first ones to tell you they like Lanceros are impossibly hard to blend because you've got a limited amount of tobacco and taco berry sentiment, the amount of flavor that they're able to de- do out of a true 38 ring gauge it's kind of kind of amazing frankly yeah it and really I, is your tasty notes i'm getting some of that chocolate sweetness i'm getting a little bit uh i'm getting some cedar but there's yeah. also kind of an underlying vanilla note mm. and almost like a hint of marzipan as well mm. yeah the, the vanilla is a good call yep. like yep. a lightly baked marzipan yep i mean it's and, it's incredible. And there's a surprising amount of spice. I never expect as much spice yes. in Atabay as I get. But it but it's not like um, you know, it's not like that in your face kind of Nicaragua spice where it, you know, comes out, yeah. hits you in the back of the head and it kicks you a few times while you're on the ground. Which hey, I like that. Um, this is more of that sort of um it kind of comes at the end of the draw, you know what I mean? Like it kind of sneaks into the profile. It's not overpowering, um, but it's just one of those elegant flavors that just it's adding so much complexity to, you know, I'm going to get halfway through this cigar and I'm still going to be discovering flavors. Yeah, I feel the same way. But I'm going to talk about my first pairing after, uh, well, 
I, I guess first I'll do our ad because it's it's time now since we start a little bit late because of those technical problems. Uh, this segment is brought to you by none other than the Cigar Federation store. Um, go there, sign up, sign up for CigarFederation.com. If you're part of the community and you go to the store tab up there, you get 10% off everything in the store. So uh, if you're already a Fed head or if you're not yet, um, make sure you use that because that's that's free money. You're leaving on the money. table if you're not using that. All right, so my first selection here is one of my <laughs> favorites. And I, before we talk about it, I was really nervous that this that all of my whiskeys tonight were going to bowl the cigar over. Because um, I wasn't sure how the Atabay would work in a Lancero. But it's so full flavored that I think that uh, maybe one of my whiskeys might blow it over. But the rest I think I'm going to be okay with. And in particular this one. This is Ardbeg 10. Um, Ardbeg is located on the southern coast of Isla. Uh, they started producing whiskey in 1978. or I read that backwards. 1798. There we go. I, re- I read that way backwards. Dyslexic, man. Uh, and they are commercially licensed in 1815. Um, they're actually closed entirely from 1981 until 1989. Um, and then they, were, they had very limited production. Like they were barely putting anything out until 1997 when they were purchased by Glenn Morangi, um, who a few years later was purchased by uh, Moe Hennessy. They only have one wash spirit, one wash still, and one spirit still. Uh, their annual production is about one and a quarter million liters, uh, or just about 330,000 freedom gallons. Uh, this is their classic, the Ardbeg 10. Uh, in 2008, it was the Whiskey Bible Whiskey of the Year. It's bottled at 46% non-chill filtered um, and carries right around 65 parts per million of uh, of peat. So it's it's pretty peaty, but not like crazy peaty. Um, and I think part of what makes it taste crazy peaty is the color. Like it's it's just kind of a light whiskey that's really heavy on the peat. So I'm going to take a couple sips, see how this pairs with the Atabay. John, what are you drinking first? First, I'm I'm, I'm drinking something a little special by way of uh, our co-host here who spoils us. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is by way of uh, the Underground Railway. Thank you very much, Barry. Um, so talk a little bit about this, although I'm sure Barry could do it off by heart. I'm going to do my best. So this is the Wigley Bridge, uh, started by father, father and son David Woods. So David and David. Uh, the younger David uh, self-taught himself as a welder uh, to make a copper still, and he learned to do this by watching YouTube videos. So all the people out there that kind of crap on people for watching <laughs> YouTube videos, he learned how, he learned how to make a copper still with a welding torch from YouTube videos. That's pretty impressive. So obviously the copper bot stills are handmade, they're hand rolled, they're hand riveted. The whole thing is is resi- it's as artisanal as you can get, unless they're you know, digging the copper out of the ground and melting it down themselves. Uh, the name comes from a nearby bridge. Uh, the the uh, story behind the bridge is that a Girl Scout troop walked across it and it started wiggling, uh, and that's that's where the name came from. It's called the Wiggly Bridge. Uh, that bridge was built in the 1930s, and it is actually the smallest suspension pedestrian bridge in the United States. Uh, this is the uh, small batch bourbon from Wiggly Bridge. You can see it's got, I mean, it's got that really nice amber bourbon quality. Uh, they age it for 10 months in uh, smaller than traditional barrels. The reason you normally do that is because more contact with the wood means that you get uh, faster aging on the spirit. So you get more of that wood quality in the spirit. They bottle it 96 proof, which is, uh, what is that? 43% uh, science ABV. I think that's how that works. So yes, 43, 40, 43, 96, 86, 96, 96 proof. Uh, I think it's 90 proof. And yeah, it's 90 proof. So it's actually 86 proof. It's 43%. Oh, it's 80. 86 proof. That's right. My, it's been so long. I can't, I can't even do my freedom proofs anymore. You can't even math. But, but I am impressed by that because you see a lot of bourbons in the market will be bottled at the minimum 40% ABV. So I appreciate that they're bottling at 43. Um, and, uh, you know, they say some of the flavors are caramel, oak, dried fruit, cinnamon, pepper, sweet tobacco, honey, grain flavor. There's a lot going on. We've had it on the show before. If you go back, I don't know. 90 episodes um we we had it on the show but um i'm gonna take some sips because i'm dying to enjoy the wiggly bridge and uh, i'll let barry talk about his first second and third pairing I, th- I think if you actually go back to last week i think i had it last week it might have been the week before um it's, but i had it pretty recently to, it's hard not to pour this like on a daily basis yeah, agreed it really is 
Yeah, right, my go ahead, Barry. Was nice enough to introduce me to that. So it, it was a pleasant surprise. So, so what but, are you drinking well, first? Here's drink? what I feel like I underperform because you guys give these great histories to everything that you that you drink. But I got <laughs> some notes this week. Nice. So uh, back in 2001, the people behind Huskin Whiskey purchased two granaries called Tuttle Hill Grist Mill with the intention to open a rock climbing ranch. However, the neighbors balked, so instead they opened the distillery, which, to the surprise, was approved by the neighbors. <laughs> and today I am drinking the, the Hudson Whiskey Baby Bourbon. And after 240 years of being a mill, the property was repurposed into the first whiskey distillery in the state of New York since Prohibition, and they opened their doors in 2003. The company didn't know anything about distilling whiskey, but in 2010, they would be named the U.S. Artisan Distiller and the Best New American Whiskey. The company would eventually go on to win the Craft Whiskey Distiller of the Year from Whiskey Magazine. And Hudson Baby Bourbon is made from Empire State corn grown within 10 miles of the distillery. The Baby Bourbon is then aged in signature small charred American oak barrels. And they never use charcoal, and they never chill filter the bourbon. And unlike you guys, I decided to kick it up a notch. So we got 46% ABV or 92 proof. Oh, nice. we're going to get there, Barry. We're, we're, we're going to get, we're there. Gonna get there. See, I start high and then work low because I know I can't pace myself. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a great reason. That's fair. Um, I have to say... Um, one of the things I think I really like about the Wiggly Bridge is if you taste a lot of younger bourbon or younger whiskeys, um, there's always this kind of, I don't know how to put it, like a medicinal kind of unmatured bunk to it. You know what I mean? Like It, it I, reminds I, me of, uh, of like table varnish, like furniture mm, varnish. Mm -hmm. It's kind of got that like almost bitterness. Uh, but it reminds me of the smell of that kind of thing. Like it's yeah, like almost like a rubbing alcohol. And and the thing about the Wiggly Bridge is it's the complete opposite. It's very smooth. It's very easy drinking. Mm -hmm. There's no hint whatsoever of any sort of harshness or any sort of bitterness or any sort of unbalanced alcohol flavors. It's just a like a dangerously easy drinking whiskey. Uh, I think Barry proved that when he uh, when he had a bit of the bottle on 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 the show. Yeah, I think, uh, what did I drink, three quarters of a bottle, maybe a little th bit more? <laughs> and, and I mean, th like, this is the kind of bourbon where you could sit out, uh, you know, uh, evening time, you got a fire going, you could down, I mean, drink responsibly, but you could down a half a bottle of this and not even know, because it's just, it's, it goes down smooth and easy, which is kind of, you know, kind of what you want sometimes in a bourbon, frankly. I don't want to compare it to a mixed drink, because it's definitely not that, but just like a, a sweeter mixed drink will creep up on you and kick you in the rear end. Mm-hmm. The the uh, whisk the Wiggly Bridge has a sweetness to it. Mm. it. You don't realize it, and eventually it will catch up to you. So it's important to know your limits and to drink. With <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, that's a good point because you know, I mean, some of the things I like in a lot of bourbons is they've got like that that uh, corn spice or some rye spice if they've added rye rye uh, rye to the mash bill. Um, but there is the sweetness. So you don't get that sort of typical. Uh, spicy corn forward flavor um yeah it's dangerously easy drinking uh barry just, must have just seen the same comment i did yes my wife's in the chat room <laughs> and the night that i drank the three quarters of the bottle of wiggly bridge my wife put up a comment that we don't mention that night at all <laughs> <laughs> you had to carry me upstairs that night oh That's wow that was a good night <laughs> it, it was that was a lot of fun that and that was like that was one of the shows that I, I know this is going to go long because that show, it was like, all right, we'll end the show. And we stopped recording and we ended up talking for like an, an hour, hour and a half, half after that. Yeah, easily. And it was like, well, we should have just recorded pretty much all of that. But no, next definitely time. not. No, no. Well, maybe, maybe a lot of it we shouldn't that, that, have. But it would have been know, entertaining. Yeah, yes. we have to walk some fine lines in the uh, cigar industry. And uh, some of those fine lines involve turning the cameras off when the yeah, alcohol is involved true. because sometimes there's a little bit too much truth. <laughs> but yeah i just want to talk about um like barry was saying there's this really like it's not um cloying sweetness it's a really subtle sweetness it's got a little bit of spice underneath that but i mean it's just it's it's complex uh especially for a young a young bourbon a young whiskey um mm -hmm. 
And I started, I started sort of easy drinking because I wasn't sure what the profile of the Atabay was, but I think like trip, um, you know, don't underestimate the Atabay in terms of flavor because uh, I think it's going to stand up to all the beverages tonight, quite frankly. Yeah, I think so too. It, it might know. not stand up to my last one. We'll see. I don't know if you've noticed, but David Woods from Wiggly Bridge is in the chat room and he said that they decant their bourbon for quite a while before reducing from barrel proof. Interesting. Interesting. So I wonder if that offsets some of the um, the younger characteristics that you typically get in a in a in a in a whiskey like that. Maybe that's. Um, I mean, is it giving away a secret? Is that a trade secret? Is he going to want to delete that post later because someone's going to steal it from him? But see, I admire that. It makes me want to drink it more. Mm. You know, with the I like the mystique of the Atabe. Don't get me wrong, but I like it also when a lot of cigar companies are very forthcoming with their blend. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like when people give you a little peek behind the curtain. Mm-hmm. Um, Atabay doesn't do that, but, uh, you know, I'm sure they have their reasons. Um, man, I'm really impressed with how the Ardbeg goes with it. It brings out, like, a a dark, m- kind of muddled fruit note. Like, it reminds me of, like, maybe raspberry jam or strawberry jam or something, or, like, maybe even stewed raspberries or stewed mm-hmm. strawberries. Um I find that it brings out a lot of that, and surprisingly, the smokiness of the yard bag just doesn't doesn't cut into the cigar at all, other huh. than bringing out some of those flavors. So I got into a conversation earlier this week with Mr. Jonathan, who I do a podcast with, and I told him what I was pairing the cigars with, and I went for sweeter alcohols because of the sweetness of the cigar, and he mm-hmm. said he was worried that it was going to wash out the sweetness of the cigar. When you pair, do you like to go polar opposites or do you like to stay in line of what you're smoking? I prefer contrast pairings, typically. Uh, I mean, there, there's something to be said for like a dark, sweet Maduro and a, I don't know, a barrel aged stout or something like that, where you're getting that kind of dark uh, coffee notes and sweetness from both sides. Uh, I think that kind of thing goes together really well. But I, I prefer something where the cigar brings out a little bit more flavor that I wasn't noticing in the whiskey and or the pairing. And then the pairing brings out a little more flavor in the cigar that I wouldn't have noticed otherwise, which I, I do find to be the case with the Ardbeg 10. Yeah, I, I find for me, um, I, and I get where Mr. Jonathan's coming from, because I think that is sometimes the risk. Like if you've got something very sweet and you're pairing it with something sweet, maybe some of that distinct quality to that. And I mean, let's, let's, let's not bandy around. We're talking about a $30 cigar. So whatever we're pairing with, you really don't want to run over that $30 cigar. Um, so you kind of, you do want to be a little careful that you're not, especially, you know, a cigar like this, which a lot of people are going to smoke as a, well, I would smoke every day, but a lot of people are going to smoke as a celebration cigar. Um, so you really don't want to run over some of the unique qualities that are in there. With that said, uh, I like to play around. Uh, so I've actually got, and we'll get there, but I've actually got, uh, so my first pairing I feel is more complimentary. My second and third pairings are a little bit more on the contrasting side and really increasingly contrasting um, because I didn't know how far I could take it. So it'll be interesting to, as I get into this sort of very contrasting character of the last uh, Spirit of the Night, where we go with this uh, pairing. What about you, Barry? Like, what do you typically like? I, I like to stay with, in the confines of what I'm smoking. Mm. So uh, originally I planned to stay within um, two liquors tonight, uh, both bourbons, um, but I was going to go up in sweetness each time. Okay. Also have Mm -hmm. a rum in the background that is exceptionally sweet. So for, for the purposes of trying to figure out how much science, much science, science of it, I'm gonna right before the end of the show. I'm gonna I'm gonna pour some of that rum, and see if it does overpower the cigar. I hope that rum is is a cap XO because I feel like smoking this, and I and you talk about rum, my brain immediately goes to the cap XO, and I go because the cap has got that like sort of toasted brown sugar coffee rum sweetness. Um, mm-hmm. That could be de- pretty pretty fun. And I wanted the XO, but. The liquor here in New Hampshire is controlled by the state. Uh, so all the liquor stores are owned by the state, and you get same pricing throughout the state. Yeah, They carry the Zacapa 23, but they don't carry the XO. The XO is special order. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, yeah. special order didn't come in in time to the show. 
crap. That's all right. That happens. Um, so I'm going to talk about my next my next whiskey here, one that I'm I was very excited to find. So this is Glenlivet Nadura. Oh yeah. Which, as John knows, I I we love this. This is a great whiskey. Nadura. But this is a variant. So Nadura. Before I show, I tell you about the vari the variants of this. Um, Nadura means natural uh, in Gaelic, and it's a it's a kind of a weird series for Glenlivet because it's. My understanding is basically it means they're finishing in a different cask than they would normally use, uh, and they're not adding anything to the whiskey. They're not chill filtering. They're not coloring. Um, they're just bottling most of them at cask strength. Um, and the original Nadura that, that most people have at least probably seen um, is finished in bourbon barrels. Then they came out with a variant that was finished in sherry barrels. Uh, and this one is finished in... Heavily peated scotch barrels. Um, and from what I've read, nobody knows exactly what peat, what peated whiskey they're using for this. Come on, focus. There we go. Um, nobody knows exactly what which one it is, but there's. I've heard rumors that it's a Speyside heavily peated whiskey. Interesting. Um, and I'm not sure what whiskey that could be. Um, so Glenlivet is no, located on the northern coast of Scotland, so basically all the way opposite of Ardbeg. Um, founded in 1824, their only closure was during World War II, uh, when uh, most people who were nearby all the shooting tended to close, um, and when all their men were going off to war. They have they, they, Glenlivet. I didn't realize they are the most popular whiskey in the U.S. and the second most, or sorry, the most popular Scotch in the U.S. and the second most popular Scotch in the world. Uh, they have seven wash stills, seven spirit stills, but I've heard they've expanded that since the numbers were written. Uh, and they distill about 6 million liters or one and a half million gallons of whiskey per year. Um, I haven't read a percentage of how much of that is or done the math, but <coughs> the reports are that they sell 6 million bottles of their standard Glenlivet 12, I think it is. Um, per year. So that's really mostly, you know, their basic Glenlivet 12. They get their water from Josie's Well, as well as some other local springs. Um, and this is bottled at cask strength, which comes in at a hefty 61.5%. That's 123 proof for anybody keeping yeah. at home. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, what we would refer to in the industry as a HEDA. <laughs> it's a HEDA. So I'm going to take a couple sips and let John talk about his next one. And can I just say that the uh, Glenlivet Sherry uh, variant is one of my favorite whiskeys to oh, pair man. with cigars. Um, that that one I've gone through many, many bottles. So uh, settle in because I have a bit of a story to tell. This is the uh, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society 132.6. And I'll explain what all that means in just a minute. This is Night Nurse Nipped by Piranhas. I'm not going to read the... Uh, description because it's going to take too long and i got a lot of information to go through so if you don't know what the scotch malt whiskey society is and you love whiskey but you hate money this is the society club for you <laughs> it is the world's largest selection of single cask single malt whiskeys available in canada and the united states so what does that mean that means they bottle they put the whiskey in a cask and then it goes straight from the cask to the bottle it's not filtered well, it's not diluted it's not changed in any way so the, the important thing to note is the single malt whiskey society wait what is it single malt whiskey society is that what it is mm -hmm. i feel like society Scot was the wrong scotch word. malt scotch malt whiskey society scotch malt whiskey society that's that's why i was confused um they buy a, a barrel at a time and they bottle everything out of that barrel mm -hmm. so so even if even if you've got a favorite distillery so let's say your favorite distillery is lagavulin or whoever you're getting a whiskey that has some of the characteristics of that distillery, but I guarantee you it is a whiskey that you've never tasted from that distillery. And the unfortunate thing for me, uh, when especially was on, when I was working in the oil and gas, is that uh, they had a lot of whiskeys, and they still have a lot of whiskeys that uh, are phenomenal. And mm -hmm. uh, every time I'd go to a tasting, I'd find three or four new favorites. So... Um, it's, it's a phenomenal group to be a part of. Um, you know, if you, like I said, if you like whiskey and you hate money, uh, you really can't find a better selection of unique whiskeys, uh, and they truly are exceptional. So what makes this particular whiskey exceptionally exceptional, if that's even a thing, 132.6. 
so, oh, and uh, pardon me, I'm going to take a step back. So we we're talking about 132.6. What does that mean? So, the, so they can't, uh, you, because they're bottling it themselves, it's not being released by the distillery. You can't use the name of the distillery. So you can't say this is a Lagavulin. You can't say this is a Freud. Even though it's their cask, it comes from that distillery. By Scotch laws, if it's not being bottled by the distillery and released by the distillery, you can't use their name. Makes sense because, you know, you're promoting something that's their company. So the first number is the distillery it comes from. The second number is the total number of batch releases that they've had to date. So this is uh, distillery code 132. And this is the sixth time they've released a dis- uh, sco- uh, whiskey. Pardon me, I keep saying scotch. This is actually just a whiskey. Um, so what this is, it's a 12-year-old uh, whiskey that was in a refill sherry butt. Only 553 bottles produced. This clocks in at a whopping 63% wow. ABV. Wow. 63 percent so if my math is is right that's 126 proof yeah how how old is that it's only 12 years so you're thinking well you know 12 year old whiskey why is that so special well let me tell you why this is special this is a japanese whiskey this is one of the few japanese whiskeys that the scott malt whiskey society gets their hands on this is from karazawa what karazawa why this is so important karazawa has been closed They've been closed since 2011. They've stopped producing since, I think, 2000. Um, Kurosawa was a distillery in Japan in Mayota, uh, which is a town in the southern slopes of an active volcano complex called Mount Asami. Mount Asama, pardon me. Um, and uh, originally they opened in 19, started producing in 1956, opened in 1955. They were the smallest distiller in Japan. Um, and uh, what made them special is they were a very small batch, very artisanal, very high quality. And initially they started out as only producing domestic whiskey. They never produced whiskey for export. They imported uh, Golden Promise Barley from Scotland um, to produce every bottle of whiskey. Uh, and most of their whiskey has predominantly been, was aged in sherry casks. Eventually, they became also the first distillery in Japan to export whiskey. Um, but because it's closed, somebody owns these these casks. And I'll talk about that in a second. But whatever, whatever production is still in the market in, in these casks, that's it. That's the last whiskey that's available in the world. So I'm sure you can imagine a distillery that hasn't been producing since 2000. That's some pretty expensive whiskey. Their production was originally limited to uh, limited to 150,000 liters, uh, or 39,600 freedom gallons. Um, but the parent company that bought them out, Curran, simply couldn't sustain the the whiskey production, so uh, they closed them and the and the sister distillery Kawasaki. Um, and then in 2011, and this is where it gets interesting, uh, there's a UK-based company called Number One Drinks, and they bought all of the casks remaining. So they own oh, wow. all the casks and they've got an entire storehouse full of these casks that they're just kind of releasing one drop at a time. I think the last time I looked up this bottle on the market, I think it retails uh, on the secondary market. It's like a $900 or a thousand dollar bottle. Oh. Um, I went, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, uh, this comes from Kensington wine market, which is one of my favorite, um, whiskey sellers they're they're one of the best whiskey stores in the in the country or in In the the country yeah in the western hemisphere Mm -hmm. and um of course i tasted it and originally when they do the tasting they do it blind so you don't know what it is and i just looked at andrew who is the whiskey guy there and the owner and he said how much is this going to cost me and he said well here's the funny thing you can't necessarily buy it i had to enter a lotto for the for the ability to buy this bottle. So I couldn't even buy it. I had, it was so select that they had like three bottles, I think for that's the only production they got. I managed by whatever horseshoe that was stuck up in my nether regions to win. And of course, if I won, I said, well, I'm going to pay for it. I don't really care how much it was. It was, it was, it was a ducat or two. Um, and it's, you know, one of the, one of the best Japanese whiskeys I think I've ever had. And, uh, I'm going to take some sips cause I've got a little long winded there and I'll let Barry talk about uh, his pairing. So I'm following in your footsteps what you smoked in the first pairing. Um, sp- I'm drinking uh, Wiggly Bridge, and I won't nice, bore nice. everybody with the uh, whole backstory since you shared it, other than the fact that it is from York, Maine, which is about an hour north of Maine. And uh, last year I told the, uh, the woods uh, from there I would come up and visit. Unfortunately, I haven't, uh, but I hope to get up there this summer. And uh, I stepped up a little bit more on sweetness, the young bourbon, Somebody in the chat room said it was similar to vermouth. I don't know if I agree with that, with the uh, with the Hudson whiskey. 
Um, but it wasn't as sweet as the Wiggly Bridge. And I wouldn't classify the Wiggly Bridge as sweet. Uh, but there are some definitely underlying notes of caramel and vanilla. And the vanilla actually has helped amplify the vanilla off of the Atabe. So, and it is uh, 80 proof. 80, 86 proof. 86 proof. And I, I corrected John about it. You would think <laughs> I would know it. But yeah, 86 proof, 43 ABV. This is what That's happens right. when we get together and drink whiskey. I just didn't want to get, I didn't want you to get called out in the comments. I figured why not call you out live. You know um, what? I, I, everybody hates, hates, you know, hate is going to hate. I, I got a lot of slack for giving Atabe Spiritus 100 rating. Um, if I could honestly smoke no cigar for the rest of my life other than one cigar, I would not have a problem with it being Atabe. Yeah, I, 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 I think there's yeah, no so cigar good. out there to me that comes close to the smoothness, the complexity, the richness. And a lot of people are turned off by the Connecticut wrapper. You know, we, we live in a in a society right now. And I'm a cigar geek. I thought you guys are cigar geeks. I hope you don't find that as an insult. Not at uh, all. But you look at social media and everything's about full body, full body, full body, full body. Yep. And there are some great full bodies out there. But there's a lot of complexity in some Connecticut cigars. And granted, some of them are like smoking air or what have you. But the Atabay brings complexity to the next level. And to me, there's no better cigar. And you know what? You had a problem with the 100 rating. I was called out on other podcasts. I was called out on, on various forums all over the Internet. Yeah, I work for the company that is the owner of the company that distributes out of bay although i do not work for that company so i have no yeah. ties and anybody here in new hampshire will tell you i butt heads with my boss all the time i am my own person this cigar is one of the best cigars out there hands down i mean you called it 100 john you called it a 100 rated cigar last year mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah i think <clears throat> when trippy and i were talking about it I, and and to this day, I say it's one of the five best cigars I've ever smoked in my life. So there's only five cigars, you know, that I consider to be perfect. And you know, perfect is a moving scale. So I can, you know, I could smoke something later this year, and it somehow moves that scale. But <clears throat> there's five cigars that I've smoked. They're all very different cigars. In fact, very very different from all over the world. But those are the five best cigars I've ever smoked in my life. And any one of those five, including the Atabe, as you say, if I had to, if I had to choose, and I was on a desert island and i could only smoke one cigar i'd be hard pressed not to choose that <coughs> because um it's it's it, it, for a lack of better description it's a perfect cigar um and i think talking about the connecticut wrapper is important because i mean they don't disclose the wrapper but if you've seen enough wrappers you know this is 90 percent sure that it's a connecticut some variation um, of connecticut yeah some Victoria. connecticut yeah. seed yeah. Right. Connecticut seed shade brown. seed grown somewhere in the yep. world. We don't know where. Um, but it's got so much more flavor than you would expect from that wrap. I, I mean, I, I just, I'm just dying to know. I hope someday they tell us what is in these cigars because I'm really curious. From a company standpoint, they have to be happy that the FDA has kept the Coca-Cola secret secret. <laughs> so there's no there's no way this is going to come out as, yeah. you know, with the blend is. But it adds to the mystique of the cigar. You know, I said before, it's true. I love it when a company tells you what's in the cigar. Yeah. Sometimes a cigar just needs to have that mystique. It's a contradiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. But I enjoy the mystique. If every cigar had a mystique about it. It would be no mystique. True. Yeah, that's true. That's absolutely true. Absolutely. Maybe we'll get maybe we'll get Nelson sauced up at the IPCPR and see if we can uh, extract some some insider in the vault industry secrets from him. There we go. Um, so for me, the Glenlivet Nadura, um, it's just got too much heat for this cigar. It's it's that level of heat where it kind of burns my palate. I'm going to add a little water to it since I've got a little bit left. Um, I'm going to add a little water to it and come back to it in a little while and see, see how it does. Cause I think it's, I think it's just too, uh, too much like alcohol burn on the palate to really get too much flavor out of the cigar, unfortunately. So, um, 
having obviously had this whiskey on multiple occasions before, one of the things that I really liked about this whiskey is when I can, because I, I have a pretty good sense most of the time when I'm tasting whiskey, roughly where the ABV range is. Um, this 63, I've always said drinks like it's 50 or 52, which is very dangerous once you go over the 60% mark. If it's tasting like it's 10%, 20 proof I mean, lower than it actually is, that that can really sneak up on you. And this does have that sort of sherry spice. I mean, it's very obvious this has been uh, in an ex sherry bot, um, but it's got just enough spice. You know, like I think about a lot of sherry bombs, like a spring bank, uh, heavily sherried spring bank or something like that. And I think that might be a little overkill for the cigar, but it's got just enough spice that it sort of walks right up to that line, then backs off, and then I get a lot more of the uh, the fruity notes, the melon notes, the vanilla. And like Barry was saying, I think, you know, the vanilla in the whiskey uh, does a great job of complementing the vanilla in the cigar. So it tends to extract more of the vanilla out of the cigar, whereas when I'm just not drinking, I'm just smoking the cigar, that, that vanilla is really, really soft, really, really subtle. <coughs> And I think it's important if you're smoking, if you're drinking a, a liqueur that has overpowering notes to give yourself time from the finish of the alcohol before you take a pull off the cigar. Yeah, yeah. you don't want to go straight back and forth. Right. Absolutely. So in the case of the Wiggly Bridge, which is a little bit sweeter, I'm taking a sip, but I'm waiting a little bit longer to take a, a sip of the, uh, a, a pull, a sip of the anime. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do them right on top of each other. Because they will wash out. Yeah, yeah, sp um, especially with anything high ABV or high proof as well, for sure. And I, I think it's important to note for people who aren't great at math, sixty percent. Once you hit sixty percent, that is fifty percent more alcohol than is in a standard forty percent whiskey. It's a huge difference. Huge difference. Uh, I, I don't think like seeing it on the label. Some people don't necessarily notice the difference, but uh, like I, I remember when I was younger, it was like. I don't know, Wild Turkey 101 or something like that is like, wow, that is so strong. And this is way more alcohol than is in something like that. Yeah, I don't find myself wanting to add water um, to this. Like I said, I think if I had another high proof, like I, I think the Nadura, like if I had the Nadura Sherry, uh, that would be too much. Like it's just, it's too much alcohol. It's too much spice. It's too much everything. Yeah. Um, so there is a, there is a fine line. And like Barry was saying, you know, and, and, uh, your conversation with uh, Mr. Jonathan, I think if you go with something, uh, cause there's a lot of whiskeys that can be, especially Scotch whiskeys, it can be cloyingly sweet. Like just like Glen Farkless, for example, is yeah. like really, really sweet whiskey. And I don't think that's the way you want to go with this cigar. I think you want something that's interesting, but, uh, doesn't overpower the, like I said, the, there's just so much nuance in this cigar. Like it's just, it's absurd. Yeah. And that's, that's the reason the Glen Livet is just overpowering with alcohol a little bit because i mean it is no age statement i don't know you, you know it could be anywhere from four years up um and that and the sweetness just overpower the atabay now that i've watered it down a little bit i'm finding it um the flavor in the atabay is really coming back i'm getting more of that spice more of that um like the it's interesting that i think the marshmallow note has kind of fallen off and I'm, it's getting like like I was saying before, like a more of a, a, a dark red fruit, like a stewed red fruit kind of sweetness. And see, I'm, I'm at the point where I'm a little, uh, I'm almost approaching the second third. And now I'm starting to get that heavy graham flavor that John mm. got in the beginning. And some of that sweetness has moved toward the background. And it lingers a little bit on the finish, especially if you do the retro hail. But it's taken on more of a graham mm -hmm. for me. Yeah, I think yeah. If, if you're smoking an Atabay and you're not retrohaling, I think you're doing yourself and the cigar a <coughs> massive disservice because this is what, I mean, beyond the fact that it's, um, it does, it, 15 like, of the $30 are retrohale. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like, you're going to get so much more flavor out of the cigar. There's, there's, there's almost a velvetiness, if that's even a descriptor in the retrohale. Like, you know, if you retrohale something that's super Nicaraguan and super spicy, you can't really retrohale it on every draw because your nose is going to be blown out. This is a cigar you can retrohale with essentially every single draw and mm -hmm. you just get more and more and more out of that cigar. Yeah, I'm I'm just I'm staggered by the intensity of it. Oh. Um like for something that's it it's fairly mild, but it's at the same time really full flavored. 
And that yeah, goes to sh- often overlooked in the cigar industry. Yeah. A mild cigar could be full flavored. Yeah. Where a full a, a full a, a cigar heavy in strength can be mild flavored. Yeah. A lot of times the strength will will mask the flavors. This cigar does a nice job of balance. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, I wouldn't call it a one or a two. Maybe not even a three. I would call it a four on a scale of ten. But the mm-hmm. flavors are yeah. a full on ten. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. I think that's a good point, Barry, is that, you know, like you said, I've smoked Connecticut's that were like smoking air. And I've smoked Connecticut's not like this, because this is pretty interesting and unique. But I've smoked Connecticut's that are, you know, more full flavored. And there's a there's a massive, massive range within the Connecticut portfolio, which is, you know, why, frankly, uh, you know, on, other than the cigar geeks out there, Connecticut's are the number one seller in B and M's because you can, you know, within that Connecticut, you've got so much flavor to play with with different brands um, that you can dial that intensity of flavor all the way up uh, without having to move up in strength level. You see, mild cigars, Connecticut wrap cigars, they are by far the number one seller inside of a brick and mortar. Uh-huh. And those who know me know I work the mail order side of the business. It's closer to 50-50 than it is 70 or 80 to 20-30. So, but I think a full-bodied cigar smoker, or, or, or excuse me, a full-strength cigar smoker would be satisfied with this cigar. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Unless their I mean, palate's all jacked up. Yeah, unless your palate's all jacked up, you're, you're going to get a ton of flavor out of this. Yeah, you're not going to want to smoke this after, say, four Crow Magnum um, cigars. Yeah, that'd be a, that'd be a bad idea. Yeah, you need, be, you need a fire extinguisher for your mouth after four crow magnets, I think. Yeah, I, I do feel like you could probably still taste this pretty well, though. Right, it doesn't after, need to be after your some first heavy cigar. cigars. You can get away with this being your second, third, maybe even your fourth cigar today, because there's so much going on. There are a lot of Connecticut's that if you don't smoke them first, you're gonna lose out. This is a cigar to just you don't have to make it your first cigar of the day. Although don't, $30, don't at thirty dollars, I don't know if you could afford any other cigars during the day. <laughs> <laughs> so I was gonna say, imagine, imagine if you could win the Powerball, and the Powerball was uh, you get to smoke uh, at a bay first thing in the morning with your Cuban coffee for the rest of your life. That's, I'd, I'd be pretty satisfied with that. I'd do that. I would do that. All right, so we're gonna take a, a quick break to thank one of our sponsors. Uh, thank you very much to Drew Estate for sponsoring this portion of the show. Um, I'm trying to think of what I've been smoking. I actually, I actually smoked two Drew Estate cigars today, um, that are completely out of my wheelhouse. The first one was the, uh, in the uh, tobacco red eye. Which, oh, I love that cigar. Never had it. Oh, it's oh, so good. It's so good. So it is the, uh, it's the tobacco blend with the Connecticut broadleaf, but it's got extra lajero in it. So it's kind of amped up the spice a little bit. Um, it kind of covers up the coffee notes a little bit. You get a lot more tobacco than uh-huh. coffee in that, which I really like. And then based on, it's interesting that I'm just realizing I smoked two store exclusive infused cigars. Um, so that one's a store exclusive for Cigars International. Uh, the second one I smoked was the Acid Supercell. And the, I have I haven't to say, even heard the, of that. I hadn't either. The only reason I smoked it, when we were in the DR a couple months ago, uh, we were there with, uh, with Jared, who... He works for Drew Estate. He's the uh, brand manager for uh, Indian tobacco, uh, Indian motorcycle, Indian motorcycle, yeah, and debonair. And he said the only acid that I love is the Supercell, and he managed to get a hold of one somehow and gave it to me. And so wow. I decided to try that. It's apparently a smaller version of the Toast, basically. Um, and to me, it smelled a lot like patchouli, but I actually, I actually enjoyed it. Like. <laughs> I, I like I liked it more than I think I've liked an acid besides the uh, the Cuba Cuba Candela, which, as John can attest, is is certainly not an awful cigar. That's actually uh, it's actually pretty good. Like I I actually really enjoyed that one. If you guys would allow me a shameless plug, please. Back in the day, two guys used to have a cigar called the uh, the uh, Dos Amigos. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It was two acid cigars joined together at a pigtail cap. So you would buy them and they would have, really? you would have one band 
and they would hold their cigar together, joined by a pigtail at the top. And the idea was behind it, you'd buy one and you'd smoke with a friend. That cigar may or may not be coming back this year. So if oh, you nice. like yeah. ask and remember the Dos Amigos, it might be coming back because it's one of those predicate cigars. I mean, for me, um, since we're, I'm, this is still part of the Drew Estate ad, but I mean, I guess it's kind of not. I just want to say, like, acid is just not in my wheelhouse. Like, I've smoked a bunch of acids, and I just generally, they're not for me. I, I can appreciate that they're made from good tobacco, but the infused element just doesn't do it for me. But there are some of them that, like, I don't know. It's like a guilty pleasure kind of kind of good, where I, I feel like I'm betraying my cigar geekness. But at the same time, you know, they're they're good cigars. If you haven't if you haven't smoked anything from uh, Drew Estate's infused range, I would definitely recommend the Red Eye and the uh, the Cuba Cuba. Well, and just <clears throat> kind of like akin to the Connecticut, you know, there's the all the boutique smokers that thumb their noses at it within the That's Drew Estate. Pro- yeah, within the Drew Estate portfolio, it's the Connecticut of their brand. I mean, as everyone talks about, you know, T52, Liga 9, yada, yada, yada. Well, those are great cigars for sure, but they're not the money makers. The money makers <laughs> yeah. for them is the acid line. And when you walk into a shop, if you walk into an actual B&M and you don't order online, so you walk into a Two Guys or any other cigar shop, you'll see acids flying off the shelf. And when you see, you know, yep. five, six, eight, ten facings of acid, you're like, what? And you'll see people walk by and they'll grab handfuls of them handfuls I, and walk up the, to the only tail. the only cigars i've ever seen bought by the box at my local bnm on a regular basis at least is acid people come Huge in and following. they just buy boxes it's crazy um, smoke anyway. what you like man exactly if, if you enjoy it smoke it don't feel bad about it like i do yeah and every now and then it's nice to return to your roots we all started somewhere different than we are you know mm-hmm. for me it was macanudo maybe macanudo baby Four months ago, we spoke to Macanudo on the show. It was a nice visit. You know, I, yeah. I, I spoke in acid. I spoke them when I first started cigar smoking in 1998. It was nice to visit. It, it's always nice to go back to your roots. That's, that's a good point. I, I didn't start smoking that kind of stuff. I started, like, the first cigar that blew me away was the Don Papine Blue Label. Back oh, in the day. yeah. Um, and that was the thing. That, that was the cigar that was like, all right, I'm going to be a cigar smoker now. Uh, that was the turning point. And then I got into all like the Don Papin stuff that they that, that's discontinued now and the uh, the tetuajes and stuff like that. Um, but yeah. and and for me, like I just passed over acid completely. I, I leaped over that entire segment of like mild and uh, infused and kind of medium bodied sweet <clears throat> Maduros. And I'm working my way back through that kind of stuff. I like it. Yeah, for me, what brought me to the next level of cigar geekery was Tatuaje. Uh, yeah. At one point, I was probably one of the biggest Tatuaje fanboys out there. And I always like catching up with Pete and what have you, but we change over time. But I still go back to Cabaguan Guapos all the time. Uh, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, let's, let's get back to the Atabay. I'm going to talk about my last pairing. My last pairing is Ardbeg Ugadil. Um, oh, I love that whiskey so much. Oh, I love it so much. Um, <laughs> It was funny because I went into the liquor store for our gin show to pick up a couple of gins, and I saw this on the shelf, and I was just like, I got to buy that. I need, I need a bottle. I haven't had a bottle in, in years. Um, so Ugadol is named after the Ardbeg, Ardbeg Distillery's water source. Um, they've never specifically stated the parts per million of peat in this, <coughs> or, or phenol, polyphenols, phenols? Um, phenols. Phenols. Not polyphenols. Um, those are the bad ones. Uh, it's somewhere around 100, they say. Uh, this is cask strength at 54.2%, uh, which leads me to believe, I was going to say this when John was talking about his 12-year-old that was 63%. Um, it has to be young, or fairly young, under like 15 years for it yeah. to get over 60. Yeah. Um, like once you hit 10, you're losing, you're, you're going way under 60. Damn angels, man, taking their share. Taking their share. Some drunk um, angels. So a really interesting note about this one is that it was named the number one whiskey of the year in 2009, immediately after the following year from the Ardbeg 10 um, by uh, J- Jim Murray's Whiskey Bible. The really interesting thing about this is, according to the Whiskey Bible, the 
the production version that you can get in the U.S. is is pretty good. But the special release that he got from Canada was much better, and that was the one he named the number one whiskey. According to Ardbeg, they've never done a special release of this in Canada. It was the exact same whiskey that was available in the U.S. Maybe it had a slightly different label because of, you know, legal reasons. Um, but according to Ardbeg, it was the exact same whiskey, which I, f- I find that hilarious. Jim, Jim Murray. Jim Murray is one of those guys. And the equivalent in the cigar industry is Jim Murray is one of those guys whose uh, mouth says a lot of things. And then you go to fact check him and you're like. I'm not sure that's necessarily true, Jim. I know you've got a yeah. really popular book out there, but sometimes you say stuff, and I'm not sure you know what you're talking about. But it's hard to argue with a guy who's got a number one bestseller year after year. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, he's. It, it's interesting, the range of things he names the best whiskey in the world varies wildly. Um, but still, to be able to say that you're number one in the world in the most popular whiskey review book in the world you know, it means something. Um, interestingly, I read this is a, this is actually colored. Um, so I would guess that it's normally kind of the color of regular Ardbeg, which is kind of light Chardonnay color. Um, this isn't the Ardbeg, but it's about this color. Because I've... Oh, there we go. Um, I mean, it's... Ardbeg is light. Um, and, of course, it is, as with, with all Ardbegs, non-chill filtered. What are you drinking next, John? Uh, and one thing to mention on that Ardbeg is it's an Ardbeg Day release. Um, so Ardbeg yes. does their uh, June release every year. Uh, usually I have to jump on it pretty quick because uh, once the stock runs out, uh, they're actually really, really tough to get and they don't remake them. So I think this year's release is the Groovy. And I have uh, heard from inside sources that the uh, Groovy is going to be one to jump on because it is I've unlike, heard it's really good. yeah, unlike it's like supposed to be passion fruit and all these fruity quick characteristics. But I'm not talking about the art bag. I'm uh, as always trying to push the envelope, and today I'm pushing the envelope with, uh, and, I'm, and I apologize for any of the Japanese uh, language listeners out there because I know my Japanese pronunciation is complete garbage. So I apologize in advance. But this is the he- Ohishi whiskey. And if you haven't heard of Ohishi, you're probably not alone. Uh, it is an interesting product on the market. It is a rice whiskey. Uh, so first of all, Ohishi Distillery was actually founded in 1872, located on the southwest of Japan in a mount- mountainous and scenic countryside. They, Again, they kind of copy the uh, Scotch uh, malt whiskey uh, style of, of doing it in the mountains um, because, you know, in many, in many ways they, they mimic the, uh, the Scottish style. So it's near the uh, tiny village of uh, Mizukami, uh, and it uh, gets the water source from the Kuma River, which is actually one of the fastest flowing rivers in all of Japan. But this river is uh, renowned for superior water quality. So, of course, wa- the water is the most important thing uh, to start with when you're, when you're trying to make really good whiskey. Um, it's a family business, and it's been a family business for five generations. Uh, primarily, the company is known for their uh, sake and uh, soju production if you haven't had soju you should try it out it's really interesting stuff uh but it is distilled entirely from rice um so you know normally we use uh, barley within uh, scotch or uh you know malted style whiskey this is entirely rice in their mash bill interesting and and then they entirely age it in either brandy or sherry casks and everyone out there should know by now that i'm a sherry fiend so of course i've gotten the sherry ver- variant uh now interestingly enough this is only 40.8 percent so it's actually quite low, but that's to do with the fact that it's a rice whiskey. Rice whiskey apparently enters a lot lower ABV in the cask than uh, than a, a barley-based whiskey does. So this is actually cask strength, according to them. Um, so interestingly enough, with the rice, there's a lot, you know, you're thinking, okay, well, they just throw some white rice in there. No, they actually use 30% estate-grown rice for their distillation. So it's actually grown on the estate. And then 70% of the other rice that goes into the mash bill is moshi rice coming oh, from the, yes. uh, the prefecture around it. Uh, and then interestingly enough, uh, again, just to talk about the sort of elegance, um, all the weeds that they use, uh, that they sort of deal with in the rice patties, they control using koi fish. So the koi fish wow. swim around the rice patties and eat the invasive weeds. Um, 
and I won't go into great detail, but you should really read up on the uh, rice the rice bill that goes into that because there's there's a lot of variants, none of which I can pr- pronounce because they're like 23 lo- uh, words, uh, 23 letters long, and I would just absolutely massacre them. But there's a lot of complex rice that goes into it, um, and then they use a pot still. Interesting. And this is the real weird one for me. Their pot still is made from stainless steel, not mm. copper. Which is very interesting because almost all whiskey dist- distillation, from my knowledge, is done with a copper still to get that yeah. copper quality. Um, so again, this is done in a sherry cask, bottle of cask strength. Um, the, it goes in the cask at 46. Com- this one came out at 40.8. Um, and it is a blended rice whiskey. So that means that the uh, the whiskey that's in this uh, ranges in age between three years and all the way up to 25 years. And nice. it smells delightful. So I'm going to take some sips and uh, let Barry chat for a bit. So once again, you're going to give me some performance anxiety. Originally, <laughs> I was going to stick with two. I was going to stick with the Hudson Baby Bourbon and the Wiggly Bridge. But for the uh, sake of the show, you guys like to pair with three different liquors. Uh, I am going to pair my my third liquor. is going to be the Kirk and Sweeney Dominican Rum. And the whole reason why I originally picked up this bottle is um, I used to work for Miami Cigar, who's the distributor of La Aurora in the U.S. And La Aurora has a rum, uh, a Centennial rum, and it's basically in the same exact bottle. So I was curious <laughs> to see if the rum was the same thing. Maybe it was made by Kirk and Sweeney and just repackaged for La Aurora. And there are subtle differences. But the uh, Kirk and Sweeney was the name of a wooden schooner that was best known for smuggling rum from the Caribbean to the United States during Prohibition. The rum would be unloaded off of the Kirk and Sweeney and put onto smaller, faster boats that would be able to outmaneuver the Coast Guard's fleet and smuggle the rum ashore. It's 12-year-old rum. It's crafted in the Dominican Republic, and it is 40% ABV, 80 proof, and it is extremely sweet. So I was curious to see how it would wash out or enhance the sweetness of the Atabe, and uh, I wouldn't say completely washes it out, um, but the two of them are a little too similar uh, to separate the two. Um, so I would recommend if you're going to smoke the Atabe Spiritus, or even the Mysticos or, or some of the other sizes, the Brujos, the Divinos, so on and so forth, if you like to pair whiskey with your cigar to stay away from some of the overly sweet stuff. Um, especially rum, when you're going to smoke the Ar- the Atabe Spiritus. So for the for the Ardbeg Ugadil, I did forget to mention uh, a portion of it is fully aged in bourbon barrels, and a portion is fully aged in sherry barrels, um, and then they they mix the two together. That yeah. Uh, man, there's a lot of that like sherry spice <clears throat> and sweetness in this, uh-huh. um, and then the, like those those bourbony vanilla notes. Um, the only problem that I have with the pairing is that the finish on the whiskey is so long that you practically have to wait for your cigar to go out before you can take another draw. <laughs> on it. So that, that was my concern um, going into this pairing um, because you know, I, I do find that Sherry's got just a, an absurdly long finish. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, again, it's one of those things where Sherry isn't necessarily very strong when you, you sort of talk in cigar terms, but the body of the flavor is so overpowering sometimes that it's actually yeah. one of the tougher things I find to pair with a cigar. And we are talking, like Barry was saying, we are talking with, with a cigar that while full flavored doesn't have a lot of, doesn't have a lot of strength compared to a lot of, you know, the sort of batiki powerhouses that are in the market. Um, and I think that's a dial you have to be really careful about because, um, you know, whether it's too sweet or too spicy or, or whatever, um, you know, you, again, you're, you're smoking a $30 elegant cigar. You really don't want to run that, that flavor profile over. No, you definitely don't. And, you know, we, we spoke much earlier in the show about the construction of the Atabay Spiritus and Lanceros historically don't sell well in the U S you know, I can't speak for the European market, they probably do a lot better there than they do here. But for me, as a person who loves cigars, one of the issues with the Lancero 
aside from the fact that, you know, it's nine, nine fifty for a Lancero and you can get a 60 ring gauge for 10 50 yep. and you got the perceived yeah. value. But from a person who considers himself a, a cigar geek, um, a lot of Lanceros don't stay lit. Mm. And I didn't see John Tripp or even myself go to relight this. It is nope. stayed lit all the way through. Even when we, we've stopped to really talk a lot about what we're pairing with, we've never had to relight it. And that's unusual for Lancero. So I have a, I have a quick funny story. Um, because, uh, up here in Canada, of course, Atabay is not distributed in Canada because, uh, well, for many, many reasons, which you can probably find out on the cigar authority sometime in the near future. Cause I'm going to talk in detail about it. Um, but you know, a $30 cigar, a $30 Atabay would be like, God, I don't even know. $150 here. Yeah. It, it'd be insane. Ironically, um, on all the Canadian cigar groups, people are going absolutely bat crazy over the Atabay. And I see people bringing in jars and I, and boxes and boxes and boxes of Atabay. Um, and in fact, I was at a herf not too long ago and they're probably going to, they're probably going to give me the gears afterwards, but there was a number of guys there that are predominantly Cuban cigar smokers. And one of the guys there handed out Atabays to all the people that came to the herf, which was an extremely generous offer. And, uh, all the guys there thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed the Atabe. And then one of the guys lit up a Bahike afterwards. And uh, wouldn't you know it, uh, five minutes into the experience, it's plugged, it's got burning issues. Um, it's got all kinds of construction problems. And I didn't see a single guy that, that you know, and look, like it's, it's a razor sharp yeah. burn. And, you know, if you're paying $30 for a cigar, if you're paying $20 for a cigar, you're expecting a perfect cigar experience. And, I love a lot of Cuban cigars, but it's a roll of the dice every time you crack a box as to whether you can get a, a well-constructed cigar or not. I, I, I don't even know if Atabay, I don't think they're capable of making a poorly constructed cigar. They're all um, perfect every single time. Yeah, I've probably smoked in excess of 500 Atabays since I started working here in New Hampshire uh, wow. coming up on four years now. And I've never had a construction issue. And I don't know any cigar that you could say. And I'm not knocking any other cigar co <clears throat> companies. Don't, don't get me wrong. But we've all run into a cigar to canoes or is plug mm -hmm. or has some kind of issue. Yeah. I have never had an issue with Atabay. And that's just a testament to the cigars that Nelson Alfonso makes. So talking about the pairing here. Um, I, I definitely paired these completely out of order. I was really concerned about this uh, Ohishi um, with the sherry cask that it would be overly sherried. But I should have known better knowing that it was a Japanese whiskey. Um, the, the flavor profile typically within Japanese whiskeys is they're all about nuance. They're all about subtlety. They're all about complexity. They're not looking for full in your face strength. They're looking for nuance. And this is incredibly nuanced. Um, if you've ever had a, a Scotch malt whiskey, and you've, you've kind of got a little bit of that barley character, that sort of toasted barley that sometimes comes through on a whiskey. I'm getting like a toasted uh, brown rice character out of this, which is really interesting. interesting. Yeah, there's a, and there's a little bit of um, subtle, subtle sherry spice. And because I'm kind of getting where Barry was within the cigar, um, what it's doing for this cigar is that that toasted marshmallow and graham cracker is like being supercharged by the contrast against that brown rice character. Um, so I'm getting a lot more spice out of the Atabay. I'm getting a lot more of the graham cracker. Um, and I can take a sip of the Hishi and immediately take a draw of the Atabay and they're not running each other over in terms of strength, which is really nice. And for our live audience, uh, we're going to wrap up the armed forces radio network segment of the show. I'm going to have a little bit of editing to do. I'm going to have to cut like four minutes out. <laughs> um, just really quickly. I want to say thank you for your service. Appreciate all that you do proud to be an american because of you absolutely i couldn't have said that better i was going to say my normal spiel but barry you said it uh thank you everybody for listening we appreciate you guys out there doing things that we're not built to do um hope you get some some time this weekend to uh smoke a cigar and maybe get a little nip of some contraband uh <laughs> if, if you've got that available to you uh we'll be back next week with another episode thank you very much for listening and now we're in our after dark segment after uh, dark this is where we get into trouble yeah this is where we get into trouble we can say whatever <clears throat> we want 
Barry, can you can I turn the filter you can off. You cigars? Hmm? Can I mention where you can get these cigars? Absolutely. Please, uh, absolutely. Bo- Bo- so I, work, I don't work for United Cigar, who distributes Atabay. So I don't. I, I can't go off the top of my head everybody that has them. But if you live in the Arizona area, you should visit Bar- Bartan and Ambassador Cigar. If you live in Florida, specifically the Orlando area, you should visit Jeff Borshowitz at Corona oh, Cigar. Man. And yep. if you live in the Northeast, you should visit Two Guys Cigars, Two Guys Smoke Shop. And if you live anywhere in the U.S. that doesn't carry them, you can get them at twoguyscigars.com. That's the number two, guyscigars.com. And I appreciate the shameless plug. And, and if, uh, you're in Canada, if you're in Canada, you can get them via the Underground Railway. <laughs> and if you're watching live, you can check the comments because Bo, Bo is nice enough to put a link to you guys right to the Atabay page. So if you're – I mean, I've said it before. And John was saying it in the green room before we started the show. If you have not smoked an Atabay, you can't comment on on Barry's 100. No. But more specifically, you can't. Uh, you don't have a barometer for how good these cigars are. To, to me, fantastic. it's fantastic. Yeah, to me, it's like um, you know everyone kind of talks about like Padron is kind of the hallmark benchmark Nicaraguan cigar. Like everyone says, you know, you got to try 1926 before you die. Uh, that's kind of the yeah. hallmark Nicaraguan experience. To me, as a cigar smoker, if you haven't smoked an Atabe and you're you know you're a, you're a guy who really likes or a lady who really likes smoking cigars, you got to pick up an Atabe and you got to try out an Atabe because I think it's one of those cigars. That's just such a unique experience within the, the sort of wide portfolio of cigars that are on the market. Um, like I said, I, I sat around with a bunch of Cuban guy, Cuban cigar smokers, and there wasn't a single one of them that wasn't completely floored by the nuance, complexity, and range of flavors. So if it can win over Cuban cigar smokers who are, you know, usually pretty pretty picky guys, I think you should try an Atabay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and not it's, everybody yeah. we know we have, sorry. Let, let me I, say one thing, Barry, before oh, you go. Ahead. We understand that not everybody can spend 30 bucks on a cigar or or maybe 20 bucks. Some of the Vitolas are only 20 bucks. Um, skip two or three cigars or four cigars um, and pick up one of these so you can try it because it will it will be your new special occasion cigar. Yeah, I mean, if, I wanted to say if you're a retailer and you don't carry Atabay, Byron, Bandolero, various other United Cigar products, you should stop by at IPCPR and see Olive in the Vode. He's the sales manager for uh, United Cigar, which is the distributor of Selected Tobacco. And you should uh, visit him at IPCPR and talk to him about carrying these cigars and other great cigars in your shop. And and, and um, like I said earlier, in terms of packaging, I mean, you put a <clears throat> you put an Atabay yeah. box on the shelf. I mean, it, it, like, I don't know if, you, if you're running a class A, B, and M out there or not, but it'll raise your class factor by at least two or three notches just having, having it on the shelf. It, it makes Davidoff look like a bundle cigar. Mm. <laughs> Seriously. Like, that's the level of packaging that they have. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Like, I mean, back to IVCPR 2017, John and I were standing around the booth, you know, talking to Oliver. I think we were waiting for... Uh, Nelson to come back from lunch, eating or or the, talking. The one meal he was permitted to have that day. Uh, yeah, and and we were looking at like the displays, and it's incredible the quality of like every box is a humidor. Like the 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 box of cigars that you buy, you buy a box of Atabays, and it's like a I don't know two hundred dollar humidor, I would say. Yeah. Humidor range, but I, I would say it's on it's on par with like a two hundred dollar humidor that you could get at a shop. Yeah, they're definitely functional humidors. I wouldn't really suggest them long term aging three, four, five years, but they're definitely functional. Yeah, it's a functional desktop humidor. Yes, I know at least guys for, that are for most of the boxes. I know guys that are sweeping up the uh, the jars because they're huge. Uh, Cubans, Cuban collectors, and they like the, um, you know, the special edition jars and stuff that you can sometimes get in Cuba. And they've been buying up the, uh, the Atabay jars because the, like, I mean, you know, the the same jars, it's the same jar (laughs) and then the production quality of the jar. Um, I'm, I'm shocked that there's not more people in the industry that have jumped on board because the packaging of the jars is like beyond the cigars being phenomenal. 
there are guys that buy it just for the jar and then they smoke the cigar afterwards and go, holy crap, I got a, I got a cigar that sort of matches the quality of the packaging, which sometimes is not necessarily the case. It's hardly ever the case. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to be politically correct. I haven't had enough whiskey yet to, yeah, to go I'm on my rent. Everybody that knows me knows I'm far from PC. Yeah, definitely. Um, and <laughs> so let, let me get to a couple of viewer questions here. Uh, Bob Finley wants to know, Bob, Bob Finley from Bob, the cigar guy. Um, he wants to know if you know, do you know if there's anybody in South Carolina that carries them? No, but if he sends me an email at, uh, at, uh, Barry at United cigar group.com. Um, I can answer that question. Awesome. Um, and he, oh, he also wants to know, is it Opus level? It's dude, it's Opus. Oh level. dude. I'm going to tell you that right now. I think it's beyond it because Opus, you got to sit on for a couple of years. Yeah, that's true. I think true. these are ready to smoke right off the truck. They, like they've said, already sat on them, yeah. The, the comparison I made is the Bahike, which everyone goes gaga over the Bahike. And like I said, I sat around with a guy who's a very discerning palate, and he smoked the Atabe, and he smokes Bahikes on the regular. In fact, I know another guy who smokes Bahikes on the regular, uh, like by the box, and he's got a collection of Atabe, which he keeps messaging me on Facebook which I'm incredibly jealous of. Uh, and he's, he's, I mean, he's not switched completely off, but he's probably got as many out of bay now as he does Behike. So, you know, that should give you a sense of the level of quality of flavor that this is delivering when Behike is kind of considered to be, you know, the sort of renowned cigar and those guys are smoking out of base. Yeah. And you have to look at it like, you know, Behike is going to cost you a, a real Behike is going to cost you 40, $45. If, if you, you, if you, if you can even on. get them. Yeah, this is a bargain. Yeah. And and Evan Kirshner says we need to convince somebody in the metro area to sell them. I would love to. I feel like shops around here can't sell enough thirty dollars cigars to justify it. Unfortunately, because I think they're I I mean I would buy them. They're fantastic cigars. Treat yourself. You only Treat you yourself. only have one life to live, man. Treat yourself. You know, like like Trippy was saying, skip four or five cigars. And, mm-hmm. buy, and buy an Atabay. And they've got the Byron line as well. You know, the Byron is not um, at the same price point as the Atabays. Um, and even I, I the can, Bandolero. Even the Bandolero. <coughs> you know, same, same level of construction. Um, Bandolero is an entry-level yeah. cigar for selected tobacco. Because yeah. you can get Bandolero at $11, $12 a cigar. Um, mm-hmm. So it's a good entry-level. If, if you want to experience what selected tobacco has to offer, that's a good entry level cigar, and it, it gives you an idea of what you're going to get from Atabay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're not gonna, you're not going to smoke an Atabay and be disappointed. I mean, no. you're just not, not unless you I, get the palate of a yak. I, I don't see it being possible. Honestly. I don't think it's possible. <laughs> Call it the Atabay challenge. <laughs> smoke go. an Atabay and tell Barry he's wrong. I dare you. <laughs> I double dare you. Fight me. <laughs> Fight me in real life at the IPCPR, bro. Unfortunately, I won't be at IPCPR this year. Um, oh. Yeah, you know what? I really have no desire to go anymore. I did it as a retailer. I did it as a manufacturer. I did it as a blogger. I really mm. have no desire to go anymore. You know, I mean, that makes sense. My boss offered me a few years ago to go, and I was like, I don't really want to go anymore. It's uh. It, it's weird because it's more like uh, so personally my my first time at the IPCPR was last year, um, and it reminds me of every conference I've ever been to, like for for tech stuff because I'm in the mm. tech industry, because you're working during the day, but it's still pretty fun, and you're having fun at night, but by the end of the week you're exhausted and you just don't <laughs> want to be there anymore. No matter how fun it is, no matter what party you're going to. Uh, by like Thursday, or I guess I guess this year it's going to be like by by Monday night or something. Um, you're just tired of it, and your body can't take anymore. But you do, but you it, do anyway. it anyway. Yeah, I mean, I would say probably forty or fifty percent of the reason I go is the uh, relationships with people in media and the relationships yeah. with people in the industry. Um, you know, and I know because obviously I'm a general manager for. Uh, uh, tobacconist chain up here with 18 stores. So, uh, there's a lot of reasons why I go 
but a lot of the reason is those relationships with those with those people down there and uh yeah there's a lot of smoking and drinking that's done after the show but there's a lot of business that's done after yeah, the it, show as well it's the only time where you can be around everybody in the cigar industry at the same time mm-hmm. uh i mean people are spread out through different countries not only different states but there are people who are full-time in nicaragua honduras dominican republic um and you're not going to see them otherwise unless you unless you fly to the Dominican Republic and get a, an Uber or whatever to their factory. And by the way, I just wanted to comment because obviously this cigar is not uh, manufactured in Nicaragua. So uh, I don't know if there's been any comments, but I've got the Nicaragua flag behind me um, sort of as a show of solidarity for the uh, people in Nicaragua. Uh, they're going through some tough times right now. There's obviously some, uh, some, uh, I don't know how you'd, how you'd really politely phrase it, but there's some, um, social and economic upheavals that are taking place right now um so you know obviously having there's been down unrest. in Nicaragua, there's very very much unrest um and as a show of solidarity i've got the nicaragua flag behind me because uh you know people people in the industry are always in my mind um and especially nicaragua uh going through this right now um that was kind of my my show of solidarity is show the flag so no disrespect intended towards atabay uh, which are not manufactured in nicaragua but still make a Phenomenal, amazing cigar. This is, um, yeah, this is this is this is great. Yeah, re- regarding Nicaragua, it, it's hard to watch the news about Nicaragua right now because mm-hmm. uh, I I think pretty much anybody who's been there, you kind of leave a, I mean, this sounds so cheesy, but you leave a piece of your heart there. Mm-hmm. Like Nicaragua holds a special place in my heart. The people of Nicaragua are so accommodating, um, and it's hard to see the position that they're in right now. Yeah. And I, I hope it, it gets resolved soon. It sounds like yeah. it's, it's on the way there. Yeah. It sounds like the, um, the violence, um, which, you know, for the record was not the people, it was, uh, the police and the government, um, which I can say safely out of the, uh, the, uh, safety of my balcony here. Um, that wasn't being driven by the people. It was a peaceful protest, um, which turned violent and which was not the, uh, the protesters. Yeah. Um, so it's nice to see that the violence has subsided. Um, but the people are looking for real change and, uh, you know, it's understandable cause they've, uh, they've been through a lot over 50 years and, uh, they're just looking for a, looking for what everyone wants, which is, uh, you know, a little, little piece of, uh, little piece of hope and, uh, some future and, uh, yeah. Well said. Well said. Um, um, we got, we some, got some viewer, viewer comments. comments. Gerard Shelley wants to know how does someone in the industry not, or how does someone not in the industry get to IPCP? <laughs> unfortunately, you can't. I mean, yeah, you can't. unfortunately, you really can't. Um, I mean, so that was I. I've been smoking cigars about thirteen or fourteen years now, and I remember back then I would listen to. There were a couple podcasts that I started listening to early on that are no longer around. Um, and I always remember thinking, man, going to the RTDA would be amazing, oh. uh, which is now known as the IPCPR. Uh, and now that I've been there as a consumer, it would suck. Uh, unless you're there for business, I, I don't see how you could really have fun unless you just fly to Vegas and go hang out at whatever bar all the cigar people hang out at for a week, which seems like a wasted trip to <coughs> And you know, next year it's going back to the Venetian in the Sands. Yeah, and they got rid of uh, Circle Bar. Not Circle I know. Bar, uh, the, yeah, the, the, bar. the Circle Bar. We well, can the Champagne the bar, bar, but Champagne Bar, right? So they got rid of the Champagne Bar, the Laguna, the Laguna, which was great. I mean, that was the place I hung out when I worked for a manufacturer. It wasn't overcrowded. Mm-hmm. It, it was more chill. It was more relaxed. Um, but Circle Bar, it's just it's just so inundated with people now, now that the other bar is gone. Even if you go there just to to rub elbows or what have you, you're gonna kinda get lost in the shuffle. Because yeah. if you remember about IPCPR, it's all about business. Yeah. Exactly. And even even at uh like you know, you're at the bar at two in the morning smoking cigars and drinking and having fun, but the main topic is is business the entire week, which is it's kind of weird, but at the same time, it works. Yeah, I think two years ago, um, there were so many people at the uh, Circle Bar. Uh, I think there must have been, I want to say conservatively, there had to have been over 225 people at the Circle Bar. 
Wow. And uh, all the hotel staff were kind of coming along, trying to cordon people into the circle bar. But the circle bar was like so beyond capacity that there had to have been at least 100 people standing around the circle bar. And, and I mean, you know, I'm a cigar guy, so I kind of chuckle. But there was like it was like going to, uh, you know, like a Pink Floyd concert because you just see a cloud of smoke rise up. And, and it was like, yeah, I understand that your systems are going to be completely overwhelmed by the smoke, but you know what? It's an industry event and we're only there for a few days. So, you know, suck it up princess because, uh, you know, that's, that's just how it is. And, uh, we only, we only get a small portion of the world to smoke in. So you can, you can handle a couple of days. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, uh, I mean, just, I mean, just one, one more one note on being a consumer, game. even if you did get into the show, it's not like people are just throwing cigars at you. <coughs> That's yeah, just think, not the way it is. People are giving I, you a cigar because they want your input on it or something. Yeah. Uh, as a as a as media, or if you're a retailer, they're giving you a cigar because uh, they want you to buy it. They want you to buy a hundred boxes and stock them. Um, you know, I I just can't see. Now that I've been there, I realize that going as a consumer would just not be fun. Yeah, I think there's this this thinking and there always has been this thinking that it's it's sort of a, a grab bag or a prize bag of cigars yeah. um and that's that's not really well that's not true first of all and it's not really the intent of the show the i mean it truly is you know as as the horrid fda says it's it the entire thing is business to business the entire reason of going yeah. is to find out um, what then, if there is a new product, what that new product is, um, there's so many retailers out there that don't carry a lot of well-performing cigars because maybe they're more traditional tobacconists and they, you know, <laughs> are constrained by their own mentality of, of what is good cigars or what's in the market. Um, so really the goal is to get people in, in stores to move out of that mentality and bring in product that they don't, aren't carrying or bring other products or other facings from that brand that they don't carry at the store. Yeah, from and, a uh, yeah, from a retailer's perspective, there's too many retailers that carry stuff out there that is cheaper online. From, mm -hmm. from a retailer's perspective, they need to get educated and, and only buy price protected cigars. Yeah, because that's the only way they're going to survive. Yeah, and well, I, I feel like price protection is kind of making a comeback at this point. Yes, thank, uh, thank you. Like, yeah, the the. I'll, like many, many of the smaller companies have always been doing it, price protection because um, that way they're they're not diluting their brand by, you know, selling them, I don't know, fifty dollars a box or something. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, and it seems like that's where the trend is moving, again, which is good because B and M's are important to everybody. And um, it's in every industry, it's not just cigars. The backbone of America. And probably the backbone of Canada, it has to be the backbone of Canada too, is the brick and mortar retailer. Yeah. Yeah. You want to keep your money in your community. If there's more money in your community, there's less poverty. It doesn't make sense to order from, from somewhere else. You know, you live in Ohio, you don't want to be ordering from Florida. You want to keep the money in your community. Yeah. I, I, um, I love getting a good deal on a box of cigars, but at the same time, price protection is really important. <coughs> Um, and Scott Jansen from Warfighter Cigars agrees uh, in the comments. There's a great it's, brand. Yeah. And I, I have Vet to hit their, their party this year because... Vet veteran owned, veteran operated, true veterans. These are not, these are not uh, you know, JROTC guys. These are guys that have been in the real thick of things. Mm -hmm. um, these are active, uh, previously actively deployed uh, people that have started up a cigar industry. And if you haven't tried Warfighter Cigars... Uh, you need to pick up some more fighter. You know, you want to talk about uh, deploy to deploy people that that keep America or even Canada or all the free free countries safe. You know, you got to support places like Cigars for Warrior. Yeah, please. You know yeah. what? If you get a great deal on cigars. All right, I get it. I understand it. But donate some to Cigars for Warriors. Yeah, because these are guys that are fighting on our front lines that can't get cigars. Or they, they, they depend on care packages, support Cigars for Warriors. Well, uh, the important thing to note about Cigars for Warriors, um, I mention this every time they come up. Since the FDA has come in, uh, manufacturers are no longer allowed to donate cigars to charity. Um, Drew Estate was donating like five or 10,000 cigars a month 
to Cigars for Warriors among like they're the only one that I have a number on. Um, but there were other manufacturers that every month they were donating boxes and boxes of cigars. Um, they're not allowed to do that anymore. Uh, cigars for Warriors is now operating off money that we donate to them or cigars that we donate to them. If you have a bunch of cigars sitting in your humidor uh, that you're not going to smoke, donate them to Cigars for Warriors. Uh, I mean, even if they're, you know, bottom of the line cigars that you don't think are worth smoking, somebody's going to appreciate that out there that you're that you're donating a cigar that they send to them um, and then they get to they have something to smoke. Don't and I think it's I think it's important to note that you know guys like Storm or all the you know hundreds and hundreds of people that are involved in the Cigars for Warriors, these are not people like a fancy schmancy um, charity where they're making money. This is entirely no. volunteer based organization. These guys and ladies put in a ton of personal time uh, to make this possible. So. Um, you know, they really, really depend on your, your donations. So if you, you know, if you get a three for one deal or a five for two deal, considering take that extra cigar, that extra two cigars and donate it to Cigars for Warriors, because I guarantee you that someone who's been out on patrol is coming back to the rack and just wants some downtime is probably going to enjoy that cigar a lot more than you will. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, well said. With plug, my apologies, but you know, if you order from two guys, cigars.com and you put in the comment field, you know, say, you know, I'm going to order a box of 20 cigars, take five of those cigars and send them to Cigars for Warriors. I'll send them to Cigars for Warriors for you. There you go. They there make go. it easy. You don't even have to, you don't even have you to, don't have to do anything. And go to the post office. Doesn't make it any easier than that. Nope. Yeah, it doesn't get any easier than that. But going back to the Atta Bay Lancero, this is what I have left. Yeah, this is what I have left. <laughs> and I don't want to put it down. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to smoke this as slowly as possible. I, I started out raging, but this is um, this is next level, man. This is this is pretty special. It when the Atabay Lancero was announced, um, this is ev it's everything that I had hoped it would be. <clears throat> Gary's I'm right that Nelson Alfonso, who I'll see in September. Thank you. <laughs> You're gonna see him before I'm gonna see him because you're gonna yes. be. CPR, so I'm going to see him at the two guys anniversary party. So, but much of you're right. You're right about the Lancero Bear. Even up here in Canada, where um, you know, I would say that guys probably smoke. Uh, it's a more even mix than the European market because I don't think you know a lot of people talk, and I get this a lot from manufacturers. They ask me as a retailer, you know, what's the percentage of Cuban cigars to non-Cuban cigars, and it's honestly pretty balanced because a lot of smokers up here. Um, tend to smoke a pretty wide variety of cigars that are both Cuban and non-Cuban. And uh, even with that, Lancero is a really, really, it's, you know, I don't remember who in the industry said it. I should really find out, but it's the best size of cigar that doesn't sell in a B&M. And it's, you know, it's really tragic um, because I think, you know, the Coronas, the Lonsdales, the Lanceros are phenomenal representation of a lot of portfolios. They're not necessarily the best size within a range, but oftentimes if a company can put out a quality Lancero, uh, you're getting a phenomenal cigar. And like Barry was saying, a lot of guys will, will gravitate towards the bigger ring gauge because there's a value proposition attached to that. But you have to think in terms of flavor delivery and a lot of times that smaller ring gauge um, will deliver a, a pretty phenomenal experience. You do have to smoke it differently. Yeah. Um, it's not a golf cigar. Yeah, it's yeah uh, golf that was, I was going to comment on that before when Barry accidentally said that he was going to take a sip of his cigar. Um, like 38 ring gauge is the, is the one place that sipping a cigar is an appropriate uh, term. Like you really, I, I once, I don't remember where I heard it from, but somebody once told me that a Lancero is the martini of cigars. Uh, you don't take a you don't take a sip of it like you do of, you know, uh, or you you don't take a gulp of it. You don't take a shot. You don't drink it like a beer. Right. You have to sip it elegantly. There are uh, some cigars you want. There are some cigars you want to take a big drawer off of, and there are some cigars you want to take a soft drawer off of. And yeah. the Lancero is that cigar you want to take a soft drawer off of. Yeah, you take a you take an. I mean that's. That's one of the things that we've talked about a lot is that you have to know how to smoke a Lancero. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of why they get a bad rap and they don't sell well is because people buy them and then they power through them 
like they would a six by sixty or something. They're double puffing and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and a Lancero is going to get hot very, very quickly. <clears throat> yeah, it's kind of akin to taking eighteen year old whiskey and just shooting it. You know, you can do that if that's how you want to enjoy it. That's up to you. But uh, sipping it is the way that you're going to get the maximum amount of flavor, and it's really the way you're going to appreciate a cigar like this. Um, you know, like this is a cigar that I kind of want to smoke. Really, as as long I want to I want to make the uh, world record of slow Lancero smoking, but uh, those guys are absolute maniacs, so I'm not even close. It was really funny when we were in the DR. They actually had that the the qualifiers for that competition. Oh. Yeah, I had to put mine down, Barry. It was, yeah, I just put mine down. Mine was down the, there. Yeah, you and me were the same boat. Mine was the size of the lid of a vertical lighter. <laughs> <laughs> See, I've got I've got that really um, that Denver type air up here, so I can make a cigar. I can squeeze another twenty or thirty minutes out of a cigar because there's not enough <laughs> oxygen up here, um, which you know gives me the superpower when we get down to Vegas, where uh, I can have that sixty percent whiskey and uh, I get a I get a little bit more of that uh, liver power out of Vegas than I do yeah. up here, which is nice. <laughs> I never thought about it that way. It's true, man. Every time a Canadian goes down to Nicaragua or the Dominican or Cuba, you know, we're like, we're basically buying a bottle of rum or whiskey per person because that's kind of how the evening goes. And, you know, I can't drink like that up here because first of all, I'd be an alcoholic, but second of all, you know, I'm look at me, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a reformed fat guy and I can't, I can't polish off half a bottle of booze unless I want to be coherent the next morning. And when I go down to Vegas, and Trip can certainly attest to this, is or Nicaragua, and I mean we can we've power bombed an entire bottle of rum, and I'm like, you know, it doesn't it doesn't really feel like that much. We should probably crack a second bottle, um, and I attribute that entirely to uh, altitude and uh, oxygen levels. I admire that you're a reformed fat guy because I'm a reformed thin guy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always joke that. Um, you know, cause, uh, I kind of, I do take the Mr. Jonathan approach where I do like, and, and, you know, Fred Rui of Nomad would, uh, massacre for me this. I, I like kale. I like a good toasted kale in the, uh, in the oven. Uh, it's like potato oh. chips for me. Dude, can but, t- uh, kale chips are pretty damn good. Kale Especially chips are really if they're good. they're like cheesy. I lost but, a little bit of respect for you. <laughs> but the, the flip side of that is, uh, I've been known to sit down, uh, with a, uh, a tiramisu, like a, like a party size tiramisu. Yeah. And I've, fin- I've finished off an entire tiramisu by myself <laughs> in a single sitting. So, Big you know, that. <laughs> yeah. So I, I mean, yeah, I can, uh, I can definitely eat several levels out of my weight class. No problem. And I'm happy to do it. Yeah. We do that at the cigar authority at the, uh, we do a two-hour podcast, and at the top of the hour, we almost always have some kind of snack. Yeah, it's the food uh-huh. authority. Yeah, the food authority. Yeah. For 10 minutes, we become the food authority, and people <laughs> complain about the lip smacking and the chewing. <laughs> you know what? You need that You need that donut or that, that yeah. you know, this cupcake or what have you. Every time I see Dave Garofalo <laughs> with a, uh, a donut and a coffee on his uh, Facebook post first thing in the morning, I'm like, man – you know, inside of me, I'm dying a little bit because it's like, yeah, I could, I could take that six pack of donuts and a coffee and I would just rage on that every morning. But, uh, that's why I'm a big guy, all those calories from his postings. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I, that's right. I get fat just looking at Dave's postings. You got to tell him to, uh, to, uh, restrict his audience for that. Cause it's, it's infectious. <laughs> so one well, thing I want to comment on which might might get me in a little bit of trouble here in the After Dark segment. Um, but I was talking about it today, and I said, you know, it's so funny that um, the world is so connected now. Like I was talking about Nicaragua earlier, and uh, so many people are connected with smartphones all around the world. Uh, but one of the things that drives me absolutely bananas in the cigar industry is that I can send an email to somebody, and they'll get it instantaneously if they're standing in a uh, tobacco field in Costa Rica or Dominican Republic or Nicaragua. And I know they've got it because I know they've got a smartphone. But the likelihood that you're going to get a response of that email from, from a manufacturer is so small. You yeah. know, you got to send a follow-up email. And then you got to send a third <laughs> email. And then you got to send a fourth email. And uh, it, it makes me laugh so much. I'm sure these guys are getting thousands and thousands of emails a day. But uh, it always makes me laugh that the, the 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 toughest guys to get on the phone 
Um, but you sit down with these guys, like you go to the IPCPR, you go to Nicaragua. And I don't think there's a single person I've met in the industry who won't sit down with me for uh, six hours. Yeah. And they'll talk <laughs> tobacco for six hours straight and drink and smoke and talk nothing but tobacco for six hours. But if you send them an email, they're like a ghost. You can't get all yep, of them. It's true. Uh, it's hard to get a hold of people sometimes. They all want us to run their press releases. <laughs> when it comes time to get in something for us, or like a response, ain't happening. Uh -huh. Exactly. It has exactly. to get posted. Hey, we're talking I, about I, I have had that happen, like where it's like, you know, I send them an email asking for something, and and then, you know, the next day they still haven't responded, but they'll send me a press release. <laughs> But I'd like, you know, on, on behalf of Oliver and uh, Nelson Alfonso, we'd like to ex extend an invite to both of you, if you're both going to be at IPCPR, to stop by the United booth. I'm sure they're going to roll out the red carpet for you. Oh, of course. Uh, I'll shoot Oliver an email to let him know you guys are coming. Uh, but, you know, anybody that wants to stop by, reach out to me, and I'll make sure the red carpet is rolled out for you guys. All right. We'll, well, we'll be there. So, you know, what's so funny about that. Uh, last year, because I've been I've been a uh, longtime listener of the Cigar Authority, and uh, last year was my first time meeting Mr. Jonathan and uh, Dave uh, Groffalo in person, and uh, I gave Dave a big hug and I gave Mr. Jonathan a big hug, and it's like even though we've never met in person, I f you know it's like one of those industry things where you feel like you know these people so well because you've 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 sort of interacted with them either online or through their podcast media, or through the website for so long that, you know, it's such a tight knit community. You kind of feel close to everybody. Everybody kind of feels like yeah. family, standard family. So when you gave Jonathan the hug, did he give you a reach around? Cause that's well, that move. So I was, I was going to, I was going to reach down and give him a little grab, um, just to let him give him a little love from Canada, but I wasn't quite sure how he'd take that. So I figured that'd be for the, the 2018 versus 2017, just kind of ease him into that. In his mind, you would have been going steady. There we go. Would have been like a Dominican marriage proposal. You know, and <laughs> if, if you don't, you know, you don't listen to the Cigar Authority podcast, you would get this humor and what have you. He's a great guy. I consider him a friend, but I like to bust his chops about his metrosexuality. He is he is a very well dressed man when I see him at the IPCPR. And, no and he can dance real good according to his Facebook. Man, mm. And I've seen him dance with men before, so <laughs> I think the um, the term manscaping was uh, was definitely invented <laughs> as a result of Mr. Jonathan. <laughs> so let me ask you this as we kind of uh, lead to the end of our After Dark segment. Uh, are either of you guys going to be watching the uh, NFL draft tomorrow? I've been boycotting the NFL since the beginning of not, not the last season, but the mm. previous season. I've, I've been boycotting the NFL since I was born. Oh, man. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, if, if 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 a team ever signs Colin Kaepernick, Kaepernick, I'll never go back to the NFL. But as long as the kneeling for the anthem is an issue, I can't watch the NFL. It's the one reason why I love hockey. You know, I, I don't know what the score is. Uh, you know, I live in New England. I'm an Islanders fan through and through, but I'm cheering for the Boston Bruins living up here. Yeah. But when they played in Toronto, games three, four, and six. When the singer sings the first verse of the anthem and then lets the entire crowd sing the rest of the anthem, yep. that's what every sport should be. So if you're sitting there and you're kneeling when you got guys, you know, and I know the armed forces isn't on the air right now, but when these guys are defending their country, and I get the right, it's your free speech, it's your right as an American to kneel, you have to show respect for the people that serve this country. And that's why I can't watch the NFL. One one of the things I love to see, I was I was down at the uh, the uh, Las Vegas Knights uh, a few months ago to see a game, and uh, one of the things I love to see is when an American team comes up here to play the Canadians, and I think there's maybe, like I think there's a lot of American players that maybe haven't come to the Cana to Canada before, or haven't you know maybe they're new in the league, and they come to a Canadian stadium and the anthem comes on, the American anthem comes on. And maybe they're not quite sure what to expect. Maybe they think we're going to boo them. And the number of times where the Canadians, 
every single one of them stands up, puts their hand over their heart and starts singing the American Anthem. And you can see all the, like there's, you can tell the new players in the team cause they're looking around and they're like, are we in Boston right now? Are we in Chicago? What in the hell is going on? And every single Canadian in that, in that stadium is belting out the American Anthem. And they're like, where are we? But it's like, to me, um, especially in the, you know, the, the hockey world, cause you know, it's in our blood. Um, to us, it's a sign of respect to all the American players. It's like, we don't want, you know, we're obviously proud Canadians. We're proud about our hockey. Um, but we also want to show respect to the, uh, to the team that's coming to us. And, uh, you know, the idea of booing, uh, an American anthem or an American team, that's just not the spirit of the sport for us. Um, you know, you want to, you want to show respect to all the players that have come up there and, you know, we are as what, what is um, Matt Booth says we're the uh, we're the ill-fitting beret. Yeah, the, the ill-fitting uh, beret of <laughs> the America. ill-fitting beret of the United States. Not not to downplay what you said, there was only one time Canada ever booed the American anthem, and that was unfortunately when some Canadian military members were killed in an inadvertent airstrike. Oh, in Afghanistan, yeah. Right, and they were booed. And Don Cherry grapes the greatest announcer of all time, specifically hockey for hockey night in Canada came out and he went on this tirade against Canadians for booing it. And it stopped, it stopped right there. And unfortunately that doesn't exist in America. You know, all this, all these people berating these people for taking a knee, it still continues. And I can't watch the NFL. I won't watch the NFL draft. I'll look the day after to see, you know, who my team's drafted Patriots fan since I was five years old, even though I grew up in New York. And one of my dearest friends is a Browns fan, so I'll look to see who the Patriots <laughs> the Browns drafted. But I can't watch the draft. I can't watch a game. And I don't know that the Patriots <laughs> need to draft anybody this year. As a uh, as a filthy Jets fan, uh, I am obviously uh, super excited that we moved up to the third spot. And uh, you know, I'm hoping against hope that we can uh, we can draft a franchise quarterback. And uh, and actually deliver some uh, some competitive some competitive spirit in the uh, AFC East because uh, it's been tough going for a very long time. I'm going to go on the record: whoever drafts Josh Allen out of Wyoming is going to get the best quarterback out of this year's draft. You think Allen's the? I think Allen's the real deal. Because everyone's been going back about uh, Rosen and Mayfield. That's kind of been the back and forth. And, uh, you know, I, I read all the, the pro football stuff and I watch all the stats. And the one thing I think I've learned after watching many, many drafts is that uh, no matter how much you know about football, you really can't tell, unless you're Bill Belichick, you really can't tell how a guy's going to perform um, based on really anything. His Wonderlick score, uh, what is what is quote unquote college character is all that stuff goes out the window. The moment that guy gets drafted and you really don't know how that guy's going to perform. And the number of, um, you look at the, the draft colleges over the years and you look at some of these quarterbacks that have sat on the bench for years and years and years. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're, uh, they're a franchise winning quarterback. There's not a lot of, there's, frankly, there's not a lot of talent scouts or coaches out there that can honestly say they predicted that, especially when you go back in history and look over the, the draft, the draft colleges year over year. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, Ryan Leaf was drafted over Eli Manning, who had the better. Right? They, I just saw a stat the other day from the uh, guy who was posting. Uh, he said, "How many how many drafts out was the, or how many picks out was the uh, Giants from picking a Hall of Fame running back?" And they essentially went back the last eight years and put, picked for the last eight drafts. They're one pick off of picking essentially what's going to be a you know potential Hall of Fame running back year after year after year after year, and these are guys that are being paid presumably for talent scouts hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars for their talent, and they're missing the boat on these guys because you know you can't necessarily tell until the guy actually hits the hits the NFL as to how he's actually going to perform. So I will be kitted out tomorrow. Uh, I will be watching the draft. I'll be watching the draft on Friday. And uh, Saturday and Sunday, and yeah. yeah. Saturday when I'm pre-gaming for the Cigar Authority, live 12 noons on Saturday. Shameless plug. Um, as I'm pre-gaming for that, I'll look to see who was drafted the night before. Uh, but with that said and done, as you said, you were bringing this after dark to a wrap. Um, yeah, I do have ties to Atabay. Um, my boss at Two Guys is also the person behind the distribu- distribution of United Cigar Selected Tobacco. 
Um, so you can argue the fact that I'm a homer. Um, I stand behind my 100 rating. Even if I wasn't an employee, that is one of the greatest cigars I've ever smoked. Um, hopefully we can rekindle what we did last summer. I would love to be back on the show, and I'd love to smoke oh, something of course. that I didn't have ties to. Um, so hopefully you guys will have me back. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we'll have you back without question uh, in, I don't know, a couple weeks, a couple months. Who knows? Hey, the weather's getting warmer, so I'm game. Yeah. I, I right? don't wanna, I don't want to drive your wife out of the house by keeping you smoking in there. <laughs> yeah, uh, it rained tonight. Otherwise, I'd be outside. So, <clears throat> All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks for listening. Um, we appreciate you guys, you know, just just being interested in this. It's we're, we're just doing what we love. Uh, and thank you, of course, to John, the cigar surgeon, McTavish and Barry for joining us. And uh, I'm going to shamelessly plug uh, developingpalettes.com, which uh, I'm a review member now. So if you want to have a good laugh at my review scores and call me a homer, uh, please do. I welcome uh, all the critical analysis of my review scores. It's it's my favorite part. Uh, I love people who argue with me, and I love people who agree with me. So uh, come on over. And if your uh, brick and mortar doesn't carry it, and always, by all means, always support your brick and mortar. But if your brick and mortar doesn't carry, you can find me at twoguyscigars.com or you can find me on the Cigar Authority podcast. All right. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next time.